chapter. Let's go to the Lord. Everybody here knows, I think, your, your body's indwelt by the Spirit. In order to be in fellowship with Him, you can't have unconfessed sin. It means if you're angry and fearful and bitter or jealous or worried, gossiping, you know, then, then you need to just be honest with God about what's going on in your life. Just tell Him your sins. That ensures that you'll be filled with the Spirit so you can understand the lesson and relate to it personally. <clears throat> well, Father, it's a great privilege to be part of your family in Christ through the Gospel. I'm grateful that Christ went to the cross and took on the sins of the world and paid them in full. Having paid them, He died physically and three days and three nights later, He defeated death. All of this on our behalf. He made it simple so that if we simply believe that He did that for us, that we'll be given eternal life. If anyone's here this morning, Father, and does not understand that or has never made that choice, to believe in that Christ died for their sins, was buried and raised from the dead, I pray that they would know and understand what to do before this time is over. Give us wisdom today, Father, about our own life. And we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Well, let me ask you a few questions. When you reach the end of your days, in what circumstances would you like to find yourself? How about being executed as a criminal, yet being innocent? Because your life and message is a direct threat to the devil's world or to whatever system you find yourself in. How about you die with nothing? maybe a coat or the clothes on your back because you gave it all away. You gave it all away. How about you're led to your execution alone? There's nobody with you because everyone that you love and have trained has gone on to carry the message will likely end the same way. So, having been freed from your earthly attachments to reattach your heart to the Lord, being filled with righteousness and sacrifice, caring nothing for yourself, knowing that God had you. Anybody? You know that's basically how the Lord died, how all the His disciples that became apostles died. They didn't pursue... Uh, the earthly. They didn't pursue the earthly. They lived in the earthly. They had the responsibilities and realities of the earthly. They didn't pursue it. It wasn't their focus. They lived with it because they were here on the earth. And all of the realities of being on the earth, they must contend with. But their focus was on the Lord. Their focus was on becoming like the Lord and pleasing the Lord. So, I want to do a study today called Doing Your Best. And this was really pointed out to me by Dr. Jim Bertell some years ago. Uh, people would tell him, I'm doing my best. He would give questionnaires and, how are you doing in this area of your life? Well, I'm doing my best. I'm doing my best. All of our lives we've been told, do the best you can. Do your best. Give it all you've got. And it's a natural and normal for honorable people to give their best in life. When challenged in maybe a relationship, situation, I said, I'm doing my best. You just have to accept me the way I am. If you ever, if you ever say that or hear someone say, accept me the way I am, Okay, I think that's a true principle, Christian principle, but does that mean in your untransformed, unchristlike, selfish state, that's how I'm supposed to? That's who you are? That's who you want to be? That's who you want to stay? 
This whole journey after salvation is about being changed. It's about being changed. It's not about, it's not about getting stable enough and getting God to support your earthly uh, goals. It's not about that. Either if it was, listen, if it was, the apostles would have been wealthy. They'd have set out centers of Christian learning and Christian mission work. They'd have had money pouring in. That would have been their focus. They would have set these things up. They didn't do that. They sought personal sanctification with the Lord, experiential. They sought personal growth and personal change. They understood that the most powerful witness for the Lord is a transformed soul that is like Jesus Christ. That's power. That's a person through whom the power of God can flow unhindered, relatively so. You don't get perfect. So, but you have to focus on that for that to become your reality, to get on that journey. If not, then your Christian life is a matter of doing the minimum and staying focused on your earthly. Listen, I know I've got family, I've got kids, bills, house. I mean, I've got all those things too. It's very easy to spend all of my time praying about my kids. About, you know... Father, you know, we need, we, we've got this coming up. It's really easy to focus on all those things as if all those things being what I want them to be is the focus of my life, is what's really important. Alabama going undefeated, winning the national championship. How many people? Dreamed of that at the beginning of the year. See? Look, nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. I mean, I live with a crazy woman about Alabama. She loves Alabama football. She loves football in general. But that's a great thing. But it can't be your life. And your earthly can't be your life. How much money you have can't be your life. How much financial security can't be your life. It can't be your life. Life does not consist of what you wear and what you eat and what you wear. Who said that? Jesus. It's not about that stuff. So, we do our best. In human relating apart from God, doing your best can be a legitimate idea, but is it a legitimate idea in the life of a born-again Christian? And I'm going to get to my point here. You're going to go, what are you talking about? Does God desire that we give Him our human best? Is that what He's after? And I, I'm setting you up. You probably already know that. The question is, has He given us a better way to live where we actually allow Him to do His best in us and through us? Let's see, all right. Let's talk about, if you'll turn to Genesis 4. <clears throat> Turn to Genesis 4, just for a minute, and we'll look at Cain. Cain gave his best. He did. Genesis 4, 1 through 8. It says, Now the man had relations with his wife. Before we get there, let me go back. Look at Genesis 3.15. This is the first gospel. Now God has confronted them about their sin. He's explaining to them the solution. I will put enmity between you, talking about the devil and the woman, between your seed and her seed. Now we know that's a reference to the virgin birth, Jesus Christ. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. He goes on in verse 20. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, in verse 20, the man called his wife Eve because she was the mother of all living. In verse 21, and the Lord God made garments. He, commit, he did an animal sacrifice of skin for Adam and his wife. 
So, animal sacrifice was instituted by God as the visual aid to the person and work of the Messiah who would resolve the sin issue for the human race. Okay, that was the, that was the symbol. That was the commanded symbol, an animal sacrifice. You remember what John said about Jesus? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Well, this animal sacrifice was the plan all the way through. When Noah got off the boat, what did he do? He built an altar and gave an animal sacrifice. When Abraham got to the land, what did he do? He built an altar and made an animal sacrifice. When God told him to go sacrifice his son upon the mountain, here we've got a, a picture of Christ. God intervened and, and they did what? animal sacrifice. This was the plan. So, when you get to verse 1 here, the man had relations with his wife. She conceived and gave birth to Cain. And I love this. She said, I've gotten a man child with the help of the Lord. That's called grace orientation. She said, Again, she gave birth to Abel. And Abel was a keeper of flocks, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. He was a farmer. So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. Is that what was commanded? Animal sacrifice. Abel, on his part, brought of the firstlings of his flock and their, first, and their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but, the, but for Cain in his offering, he had no regard. He rejected it. So but Cain became very angry and his countenance fell. Now the first gospel and animal sacrifice and all the way through Abraham and Mosaic law indicate that this was the correct thing to do. In fact, God's going to tell him, if you do the right thing. Oh, that's somewhere down here. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your countenance fallen? If you do the right thing, if you do well, in other words, bring the animal sacrifice, which means faith in the Messiah who's going to resolve the sins of the world. Won't you be happy? Won't, won't things work out good between us? So, rather than submit to God's grace plan, by believing the gospel expressed in ritual form, Cain decided that God should be willing to accept his best. He gave God the best he had of his own works. That's what we call religion. Cain's refusal to obey and give up his human agenda, what we started off talking about, what's your life about? What are you pursuing? I heard a thing this morning, I got up early and was listening. You know, biologically, human beings are, are geared, they're made to pursue. It's the pursuit of your goals that caused the growth, that caused the, the enjoyment. It's, we think, see, here's what's deceitful desire. We think if we get what we want, if we get what we're pursuing, then that will create happiness. In fact, it does the opposite. The pursuit fires off dopamine in your brain and serotonin making you feel great in the pursuit. You're pursuing whatever your goals are. You know, we've always been told you have to have goals. But it's the attainment. Once you attain it, and you have it for just a moment, your brain begins to produce, it begins to drop all those good-feeling chemicals, and you feel dissatisfied. you got to have more. That's how people become addicted to drugs. The deceit is getting what you want, will beat will make you happy it's the pursuit it's the pursuit see we're not going to become like christ her completely it's the pursuit of becoming like christ that's supposed to be our life it's not the pursuit of the earthly it's the pursuit of becoming like him look it's not even the pursuit of ministry ministry is a result of pursuing becoming like him what stands in the way, what's in me and from me and that stands in the way of me being like Him? I have the Holy Spirit. I have tons of the Word of God. 
What's keeping me from being so sacrificial and loving and kind and gracious like Him? What's keeping me from doing that, from being that person? It's me. It's the old me. But I'm doing my best. You get it? I'm doing my best. God said, I know you are, but I don't really want your best. I want you to give up your best and take my best. So, Cain's refusal to give up his human agenda result, resulted. See, what happened when Cain said no to God, he said sin is crouching at the door like a hungry animal to pounce on you and eat you. If you, if, you don't, if you don't defeat it, if you don't stand up against it and say no to it and yes to me, it's going to eat you alive. And it did. And then it turned into murder. Now, I'm not suggesting that if you focus on your earthly agenda, you're going to turn into a murderer. That'd be a good, that'd be good leverage, wouldn't it? You must give your money now or you're going to end up being a murderer. Yeah. So when we hold on to our own plan and we do our best, we refuse to humble ourselves to be transformed. We exchange our human best for God's best. So, turn over now to Matthew 26. I want to show you another example of somebody doing their best. And listen, and sincerely believing that this was the right thing to do. Matthew 26, 31-35. This is, oh, I don't know if they're still in the upper room or if they've already left. Probably they're still in the upper room. In verse 31, Matthew 26. No, wait, they've left. They've gone to the Mount of, they, they sung a hymn and they went out to the Mount of Olives in verse 30. And then Jesus said to them, you will all fall away. You'll all run away because of me this night. And he gives them prophecy. I will strike down the shepherd and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you into Galilee where I want you to meet me. Okay? So here's the Lord giving them prophecy out of Old Testament Scripture, explaining to them what's going to happen this very night. Here's what's about to happen. Soldiers are going to come. You're going to be scared. You're going to all run away. You think that set well with them, with these men, these big brave men? Peter, even though everyone else may run away because of you, I will never run away. <laughs> Jesus said, listen, man, I know you're trying to be tough. I know you're trying to be loyal. I really, I really love your heart, Peter. But this is not what I need from you. Peter says, or Jesus says, Truly I say to you, this night before the rooster crows, you shall deny me three times. He said to him, Even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same thing. Now, the Lord has already told them, the pressure is going to get too great, and, and you're going to break and run. And this happens to us in our life. The pressure gets too great and we fail. We, we run away, we hide, we deny, we, you know, we, we distract ourselves. You know, the whole entertainment industry has made zillions of dollars on people trying to distract themselves from the realities of their life. <clears throat> Dealing with the issues that they've never resolved. They just distract themselves. That's running away. You know, when you refuse to face the hurt and pain or the relationship, I mean, who in your life are you at odds with? Who are you, who are you at odds with? And is it possible to reconcile? And you go, yeah, maybe. Maybe not. I don't know. I'm not going to do it. What is that? You're not willing to confront this issue. Look, I'm, not, I'm not accusing you. I'm not fussing at you. Maybe I am, but I'm fussing at me. Because I have someone in my life like that. Democrat. Uh, 
Jesus prophetically warns them about what is about to happen, but they refuse to believe Him. What happens when we refuse to believe the Lord? What do we believe? What did they believe? They believed that they could muster up their human effort and their human courage and stand against the pressure of the, the demonic world and Rome and Israel, both evil, coming down upon them and through human ability stand up to that and be loyal to Jesus, their friend. Is that realistic? Is that even what God wants? Did God want Peter to die that night? See, this human thing, this giving our human best, and I'll, I'll make it a little more personal in a minute, is a distraction from being transformed into the image of Christ. It's a distraction. So, what was the proper response? Believe and submit to the Lord by preparing to get through the night. Rather than believe and submit to the Lord, they and Peter especially decided to give Him their best effort at human loyalty, pledging their lives rather than running away. This is human works rather than faith and obedience. Peter was so afraid of his being seen by others as a disloyal coward that he refused to follow the Lord. You know, a lot of our human agenda and our old system has to do with how people see us, how we're perceived. It goes all the way back to our early days when we didn't have any love of ourself. We didn't even know what our self was. And it's other people's love for us that gave us a sense that we're, we were okay, that we were valuable, desirable. If your family loves you and desires you, then I must be desirable. That's where that starts. And it parlays into, I must appear to be the right way and to other people so that they will admire me and respect me and love me and want me. I must appear. So Peter's appearance, he just couldn't stand the appearance of being a coward. What will everyone think? What will everyone think? Is that ever a thought in your mind? What will everyone think? How will this look? I don't know. How, was it? How will it look? Maybe it'll look real instead of put on. Maybe it'll look real. Maybe you'll be able to interact with somebody in a real way. You know, and just instead of socializing. Maybe you'll be able to react, react with someone based on their need. Discern their need and see that they're struggling. See they're having a problem. Look for things like that instead of just socializing. Oh, it's so good to see you. I'm not criticizing any of you. I'm just saying the focus has got to be the spiritual. It's got to be the spiritual. So easily drawn away and distracted from it. So Peter offered the Lord the best of his human courage and loyalty. This is a simulation of the Christian life. It's interesting in Luke 22, 60 through 62, when Peter gave his third denial, it said that across the courtyard, the Lord heard the rooster crow and looked over at Peter, looked right in his eyes. And Peter realized that he had just done exactly what the Lord said he would do. And it broke him. It broke this human ability, this giving him the human best. It broke it. And he went out and wept bitterly. And it took Peter weeks and months to ever recover and realize this was not about his giving his best. It was about giving himself to the Lord and letting the Lord work through him change him inside. Peter had a lot of change. You can find the same idea in Revelation 3, 14 through 17 with the church of Laodicea. They were focused on their human wealth, human ability, and neglecting their transformational change. So, let's look at a few principles. First of all, what I want to do is try to develop this human side and help us to see it, help us to be able to relate to it. So we're all born without God and truth, 
And the first ideas that we develop in our life come out of relationships with people instead of God and the world instead of the Word. Because we don't have God. And so we develop our, our initial ideas about what's important and what will give us happiness and what we should pursue. Uh, we, we build all that into our heart out of what we see in our life, what's in the world. Of course, God's over here and He's cut off. See, and we don't know God until we believe the gospel. Then we're connected. Then we can start seeing truth. Oh, wow. Before that, we're just like everybody else. You know, we want, we want to be loved. We want to find approval. We want to have a group that accepts us, thinks that we're great. On and on. This is our life. So, we take people and we turn them into idols. You know how you turn a person into an idol? Is you begin to think that they or what they have or what they give is your source to fill the emptiness in you. People do this in their marriage, and this is a setup for failure. It's a setup for divorce when people make the, the other person into an idol. You're supposed to meet my needs. So that's one of the mis, misteachings about marriage in, in, in the Christian church is he's supposed to meet her needs and she's supposed to meet his needs. Who in the world's able to do that? You couldn't meet my needs, every one of you all put together if you tried. Neither could I meet yours. You know why? Because it's not made that way. Here's how it's made. I get my needs met from the Lord. Look, there's some human needs that we share with each other and we do our best with each other, do our best. But I get my needs from the Lord. Rhonda gets her needs from the Lord. And we join together to have a mission for the Lord. That's a real marriage. It's not just, well, we had such a great time being married. Well, I'm glad you did. I mean, that's fine. If you're compatible and you have fun and you enjoy each other, that's a great blessing. It's not the point. It's not what it's for. It's not what it's for. See, that's our earthly focus. As long as we just get the most out of this life. See, if you don't have the next life, then you get the idea that you've got to squeeze everything out of this one. It's just not true. You've got the next one. The, point, the issue is to let this one go. It's all messed up. Did you not know that the world's all messed up? Anybody know that the world's all messed up? All this stuff. And see, we think, if I could just get the things I want, Lord, please give us some money. He's like, what do you, why do you need money? Well, I just want to do these nice things. You know, if you, got, if you got the money and you got the nice things, it would just let you down. You're better off just to keep pursuing me, son. Just keep pursuing me. I want to take every, every step you make, I'm going to bring the ground up under you. Don't you worry. There's no issue about logistics. We're worrying about logistics. i got logistics covered. Pursue me. Pursue me. Not turning people into idols. So, so we turn people into idols believing that their love and approval can fill the emptiness and give us a sense of self-worth. I'm worth something if people like me, if people love me, if people want me. So what people think is the standard by which I evaluate myself. That's why we get into this appearance thing. <clears throat> because what people think about us is our standard. It's the guideline by which we determine I'm worthy or I'm unworthy. So, apparently Paul dying alone under a Roman sword meant he was not worth anything. That's the human thinking. Thirdly, what I call idolatry loops. We turn a person into our source of love by trusting them to meet our needs. Another human being. What is the inevitable outcome of that? They look, they're doing their best, but it fails. 
They can't, meet, they can't give you what you're looking for from them. Blood from the turnip. They can't do it. And so what happens? You think, well, the whole thing's a bust. You get hurt. You know, maybe they betray you. You know, maybe they really fail in your life. You get hurt and you knock them down off of this perch you put them on, this idol stand that you put on, and now you're just hurt and angry and bitter and everything. And then, you know, maybe you get rid of them, maybe you don't. But the next thing you do is you find someone else to do the same thing over and over again. That's a loop thinking that you can get your needs met from any person or situation in this life, that it's somehow going to satisfy you. The moment you get it, it's going to be a letdown. It's going to be a letdown. Then you're going to strive to get it again. It's going to be a letdown. It's what it, that when, you ever, when you attach your heart and your needs to people in more than a superficial way, it always lets you down. It's it, because people don't have what you're trying to attach to them. They don't have it. Only God has it. So, this is the story of America in the 21st century is that we want so many things that wouldn't help us if we had them. We've got so caught up into just insanity. We need some, we need some straight thinking. So we... We program our values and thoughts, producing behaviors to create an image. We create an image. This is what happens in churches. I've been in a, I've been in a number of churches. I've been, a, I've been a member of several churches. And I remember when I was first in a church, watching what everybody did, learning what the Bible said about what a Christian's supposed to look like. What a Christian's supposed to say and not say, do and not do, what kind of demeanor does a Christian have? You know, a Christian's supposed to have unconditional love. Well, I'm a baby believer and I have no capacity for unconditional love. I'm still very, very concerned about myself because I just came out of the world where myself was the issue. Now I'm in Christ and I'm connected to Him and I'm learning God's Word, but... I'm still very, very much a baby. So what do I do? Do the same thing I've always done. I look around at what other people are doing, and I pick out somebody that I think is very successful, and I begin to imitate them. I begin to carry myself like they do. I begin to talk like they do. Use the same rhythm they do. Say the same words. And I mean, now all of a sudden, I look successful. Right? I'm a successful Christian in the eyes of the people around me. I'm doing my best. That is not Christianity. That is not Christianity at all. And so I ask you, have you settled yourself into this church? Got into the rhythm and you're just kind of going along with it and going along with it? and focusing on your earthly life because you're just sort of going along rather than looking at your circumstances as a, an opportunity to see yourself, to see your flaws, to be willing to change. Huge difference. Over here, we're just doing the best we can. Just doing the best we can. Over here, we're looking straight in the Lord's face going, show me how to be more like you. Show me how to be more like you. I mean, do you, do you take that seriously? You might have noticed the things that I teach, they're all about doing it. It's about doing it. And I'm not bragging on myself at all because I'm far from doing it. You can ask my wife. I mean, ask my kids. Biggest hypocrite you ever saw. But I'm going there. I'm headed there. Now, I'm just encouraging you to see if you're not, and to get on that path. That's an encouragement. Maybe an admonishment. Peter was obsessed with his image before Jesus and the others. 
couldn't allow himself to be weak or disloyal. Listen, are you able to let yourself be seen as weak? Can you let other people in your life see how weak you really are? Or do you have to keep this image of having it all together intact? Now, I'm not saying you should come in here and lay all, let your hair all the way down and air your dirty laundry. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying, are you transparent? Are you able to be vulnerable with people that care about you? Or is it just an image? You know how important that is? See, this is real transformation. Not just learning a system and learning to do it. Learning to simulate it. Pretty important stuff. The primary motives behind our human behavior is what others think. They, they tell us whether we're good enough or whether we're not. We're worthless. So what Paul calls the old man, and I have decided to believe is a belief system that produces our behavior, comes this deeply ingrained habit in the early part of our life that is, it begins, it operates automatically. We don't even realize it. It continues to control our motives and core behaviors even after salvation and even after we know a lot of Bible doctrine. Is still there in the core operating where now I have God to enlist to achieve my earthly goals. So here's a question about your prayers. Are all of your prayers designed to get God to improve your earthly circumstances or someone you love's earthly circumstances? Open the door. Make a path smooth. Make everything work for them. You know, don't, don't let my baby suffer. That's, just, that's the earthly focus. I mean, I'm there with you. I got kids. I pray, Father, please keep them safe. Gone to the beach. Lord, please keep them safe. You know, this, this momentarily neutralize that stupid thinking they have till they can get back home. Pray all these things to keep them safe. Why? Because I couldn't stand to lose them. That's not true. I could stand to lose them. If I lost them, where would they be? They're both safe. My little girls. Yeah. I mean, they still live with us, so I still think of them as my little girls. So, see, that's my earthly focus. My prayer is not, Father, let them, let them meet obstacles that will train them, that will teach them, that will humble them, that will show them they need you more than anything. That's a prayer. That's a real prayer. Father, turn my little girls into monster Christians. I know how much suffering that's going to require. I know that. Am I, am I courageous? Do I really trust God that that's what we're here for? Or am I still wanting everything to work out earthly? So, as new Christians, we learn what we should appear to be, what to do or not to do. We fall in step with those around us, imitating those we consider successful. I remember when I first got involved in, in the doctrinal church, uh, there was a very famous pastor that was the beginning of it, Bob Theme, and all the different teachers that came along, they, they imitated him. They used his same tone and that's dogmatic, blah, you know. He was, the, he was the image. Here's what success looks like. And so people gave up their own personalities and adopted his. Just basic human imitation is how people learn and develop. You know, you enter into some new area of your life and you're an imposter. You don't know, know what you're doing, but you look at somebody that does and you begin to emulate them until you grow into it. That's normal human learning. But that doesn't work in the Christian life. It's not about that in the Christian life. 
It's about boiling you down to who you really are and, and letting that go so you can become like Him. All right, so we can develop knowledge of biblical concepts, biblical vocabulary. But here's the question. This is the question I ask myself all the time. Are you radically changing inside? Are you changing inside? Or are you just going through the same old day, every day, the same old routine, the same old everything? You got everything down with the Lord. You know, you know what you're supposed to do and not do. You got it all in, in you know, tightly packaged, and you just go through your day. Is that it? Is that what is that your life? I don't think that's it. That that's called that says you've fallen asleep. You've fallen asleep. You're just going through the motions. Oh Lord, thank you. You're so great, wonderful, wonderful. And it's true. And you believe that and you feel that and you love him. But are you willing to let him expose you? See, we just learn how to make it look right. And we just ride with it. That's called doing your best. This is what Dr. Bertel helped me see. So often we're safe, secure, we're in union with Christ, indwelt by the Spirit, walking in the Spirit, exercising our spiritual gift. But inside, we still are plagued by guilt, shame, fear, anger. And even in spite of that, listen, I spent many days years early on coming in with you particular people some of you've been around a long time just just miserable inside miserable inside because i wasn't content i wasn't happy with my circumstances i thought that i needed something more than i had i was telling gary kept telling myself, this is a little clue for you, I kept telling myself, I need more from her. I need more from her. And I was discontent. Always. Never satisfied. Everything had a frown. And then one day I heard that because I started listening again. Y'all should ought to listen to what you tell yourself. It'd be, the, it'd be the best thing you ever did in your life. And I said, I'm not going to say that anymore. You know why? Because it's not true. That's me. Oh, I'm doing my best, though. No. Nah. Ain't about that, dummy. Quit saying lies. If you needed more from her, I would cause her to give you more. Do you believe that, son? I said, I know that's true. Stop saying that lie. Yes, sir. And when I did, everything, my whole demeanor changed. My whole expectation system, my whole everything changed. Why was I unhappy? Telling myself something that wasn't true. That old system, that old habit, I need more. I need more. It's not enough. See, you don't need more. You have exactly what you need right now. Exactly what you need. To do God's will. That may not be exactly what you need for your earthly plan, but for what God's after with your life, right this moment, you have exactly what you need. Now, is that true or not? Tell me. So why do you want more? You go, I don't know why. I'll tell you why. Because somewhere in your past, you decided that having more, so you fell into the same trap that you having more or better would make you feel better, would give you happiness. Would, 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 that, that's what we're supposed to get. We're supposed to just keep trying to get more. History, human history is amazing. 
all the way up until the Middle Ages and when Christianity really took a hold. You know, 300, 400, 500 A.D. Before that, history was nothing but empires. A nation would become strong. They would get a strong leader. You know, Alexander the Great. And go and conquer everything you can and take everything you can. Then somebody else, then that, that group would get weaker. Somebody else would get stronger. The Romans come along and take from the Persians. I mean, from the Greeks. The Greeks took it from the Persians. The Persians took it from the Babylonians. All the way up, literally till after World War II, it was all about empires. And what we discover is that about 3, 400 AD, that a difference begins to form in the, in the history of mankind. A different idea. And that is the idea of the value of the individual soul. The inherent value in God's eyes of the individual person. It came, you know where the came Christ. This is what eventually led into what we call Western civilization where America was finally founded on the idea of no more empires. See, America refused to become an empire. After World War II, we could have been an empire, right? Like the British. In fact, we, we shut down all the empires so that the world could be filled with free people who had individual rights and individual choices. No more taking from everybody. That's Christian. See, the world is more. Human nature is more, 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 more. God said, you don't need more. You don't need more of that. You need more of me. So, I hope this is helpful to you. So, Christian image. Our fear of being exposed and embarrassed Showing our weaknesses or having our weaknesses seen. Knowing people knowing about our sins, our failures, what's really going on in your marriage. I mean, question. The Lord came in and took the veil off of your life so that other people could see the real you. Your real thoughts, that you're really not that stable, you're fearful. You're very fearful. Oh, Lord, we're so fearful, people. We're so fearful. We're so fearful. Afraid we're not going to get what we want that we think we need. Afraid that what we have we're going to lose. You know, I've got these beautiful kids that are trying to grow up and have a life. Can't stand the idea of losing one of them like they belong to me, like they're my happiness. See, so there's an attachment of this emptiness in my life to them, to my marriage, to my church. You know, if my church doesn't want to hear what I have to say. And I spent my whole life developing ideas, putting them together coherently and sharing them with others, and if nobody wants to hear it. The Lord does. So, God is only interested in your true... This is really important. He is only interested in your true self. The weak, angry, frustrated, fearful, real you. He doesn't want you to clean up your act before you come before Him. You say, well, what about confessing my sins? Well, if you come before Him with your sins, is that not the same thing as confessing them? Here I am, Lord. I didn't get cleaned up before I came in the throne room. He said, I could see that. Here, let me get the hose. Let me hose you down a bit, son. And like, please, sir. Real you. The angry you. The confused, the disillusioned you, the you that doesn't know what's going on or what's going to happen next. 
See, that's who God wants. He wants you, not this image of you that you give to other people. This, this professional you. This put together you. Look, we all appreciate we put ourselves together and we come and we meet and you know, we don't burden everybody with our problems and listen, we would be so much better off if we did. We would be so much closer and intimate and real and powerful and have a, an appeal that because people could come in and be real. They wouldn't have to come in all dressed up and just pretend that they're and they're they're in their church mode. Let's go to that little white church. We'll go in there and be in our church mode and pretend to be religious for a couple of hours. You know. No, if the key see, Paul said to the church at Corinthians, they were having a struggle with tongues. And he said, instead of speaking in tongues, you should prophesy, which was pre-canon before the Bible. The prophets understood the biblical principles before they were written down and could teach them. He said, if the, if the unbeliever comes in and you're all speaking in tongues chaotically, he's going to think you're insane. But if he comes in and somebody is teaching the Word of God, he said it will expose the motives of his own heart. He will see himself, the real him, the real me, see himself. And because of that, he will fall down and worship God, saying that God is among you because his heart was revealed. Not his image, his heart. So we're going to come back in the second half and I'm going to talk about the Christian life. Like I said early on, I tried to figure out what Christ was, what I was supposed to be like, and I tried to be that way. But it was it was me trying to be that way. It was my human effort trying to be that way, and uh, and it seemed it seemed to be acceptable to the people around me. They thought, well, that was great, but it wasn't it wasn't real in me. It was all I was still all mixed up. So. Let's talk, let's talk about what the Christian life really is. And before, I, I want y'all to pray for Jackie because these things that I've been talking about, she found a ministry where she goes over the world to different places and finds women that have been through really difficult things. Uh, one of the guys I've begun to support out of my, uh, my Al Rosenblum Ministries is a man named Emo who lives in Nigeria. And he talks all the time about the, the wild, crazy things that the Muslims do. They go and attack churches. They kill the men. They steal all the girls and the women, and they turn them into slaves. And he said this goes on all around him. Well, people in other parts of the world, these women have gone through horrific things. And they try to get back to a normal life. Once they escape it and they try to get back to a normal life, but listen, that, that hurt and pain is still inside there. That's the kind of stuff I'm trying to talk about. We put out an image. I'm okay. Everything's okay. You know, yeah, my marriage is great. You know, everything's going well. Yeah, I got it going on. I'm, everything's good. No, it's not. And we need to quit pretending about that. And this ministry that she has is that she helps people break free of that image and be able to be real. And I'm grateful for it. So anyway... What does it mean to be a Christian? Let me look at the three things here. First is the goal to become like Christ. See, there's a lot of ways to describe what the Christian life is supposed to be. It's supposed to be witnessing. It's supposed to be ministry. Uh, I think probably the core function of the church is evangelism. 
More than anything, what's important is if a person goes to heaven or hell. That's my opinion. I mean, all, we could be this great, powerful church and never evangelize, and we wouldn't be part of God's plan to bring people into the kingdom. So, but how, do, how does that work? See, the Christian message in, in this day and time has lost so much credibility. The church is just not credible because we don't live lives. You know, like I said, I listen to my own children. They go, you know, you, you said all those things to us and you preached all that stuff, but you didn't very live it very well. Didn't live it very well. That's my transparency. I didn't live it very well. Wanted to, tried my best to, didn't do it. Didn't happen. Not the, not the way I wanted it to happen. And so, you know, people, people, in your, people around you, they end up with the after effects of your own failures, your own sins, your pettiness and frustration because you couldn't give it to the Lord. But I forget where I'm going, but. The Christian life, the goal is to become, what, oh yeah, I was going to say, the credibility of the church is from the lived lives. The transformed life of love and service. Jesus said, put yourself last. Love without any conditions, without any limits. Give yourself away. Give it to me and give it to everybody else. Give yourself away. They died with nothing because they would given it all away. They didn't need it. They had everything they needed. What they needed for the next day, if they lived, would be provided. And that's how they lived. So the goal is to become like Christ. That's, what, that's my theory. That's my supposition. To become imitators of God. For instance, in 2 Corinthians 10.5, Paul in Corinth was facing all of these philosophical ideas. He says, we're going to destroy all of those ideas philosophical speculations and every lofty th everything that raises itself up above the knowledge of God and we're going to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ bring every thought surrendered and obedient now that's my goal for me now will I ever get there of course not I'm still in this body I'm still in this life you'll never get but I'm going to go as far as I can with it <clears throat> So that my thoughts are focused on Him. That my thoughts are surrendered and obedient to Him. Is that right? Is that possible? So I think sometimes we look, we hear things like that. I'm going to be like Christ. And we think, oh man, that's just way too far to even think about shooting at. You know, it's just not possible, so I'm not going to try. That's not, the, that's not it. Ephesians 4.13 says, Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man. So there's our knowledge and there's our implementation of knowledge into maturity. Now, unto the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. So we're to grow spiritually in ourselves with you and the Lord in, into this place where you are, you are comparable to Him. In fact, who do you compare yourself with? When, your life, when, you, when you do things in your life, who do you compare with? Do you compare with other believers or other people? I'm, you know, at least I'm not like so-and-so, like the unrighteous guy. You know, at least I'm not like this sinner over here. Uh, I remember growing up with some religious people in my family always talking about the people that hung out in the bars and stuff. You know, at least we're not, not like them. And uh, I always thought, sounds kind of fun to me, but I never would dare say that. My father's side were all religious and my mother's side were all bootleggers, so... It was an interesting mix. 
Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1 through 2 says, Become imitators of Christ, imitators of God, and walk in love as He walked in love. Here's our goal. That's the means. How do we do this? I don't know how many times I've had people ask me, as, as the counselor, how do, how do I do that? Well, I'm supposed to feel this way about my life, about my relationships. I'm supposed to feel this way. I know that. But I don't. If I'm real, I don't feel that way. Now, how do I get myself to feel that way? You know, I don't know I'm supposed to love God more than anybody else, but I don't. It's not true. I pretend. I take that posture, but the truth is I still love other things more. If I'm being honest, and of course the Lord said, please be honest. I don't need that pretending thing you're doing. Just be real with me. I know you're not there. Let's talk about how to get there. So, the Bible says transformation. It's exchanging your human system that you developed for His. 2 Corinthians 3.18 But we all with unveiled face, meaning zero pretense, beholding as in a mirror, and that's the person of Christ, we're looking at Him, the mirror, the Word of God is the mirror. And you look in the mirror and you see His face. It also gives you another mirror that you see your face. And everything that you think, feel, say, and do is to be looked in the mirror and compared with Him. And with what you think, feel, say, and do doesn't match Him. It says there's a root of something in me producing something other than Him. I have the Spirit. I can walk in the Spirit. I have the truth. Why am I not producing Christ? Why, am, why don't I look like Christ? Why is what I'm producing filled with fear and worry and bitterness and anger? Why am I producing that? There's a root. This has got to be transformed. So you look into the mirror of the person of Christ and you see the glory of the Lord. And as we do so, we're transformed. It means to exchange beliefs and behaviors and patterns transformed into the same image of Christ from our salvation glory to our eternal glory. And the master of ceremonies is the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4, 22-24, this is the last thing Paul ever wrote about this subject. In 12, Romans 12, 2, he says, be transformed, stop being, stop being conformed to the image of the world. Instead, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Later on in his life, after he'd been through some real purifying experiences like jail, like Jerusalem and almost getting lynched and then going to jail for several years and ended up in Rome, he writes this, you were taught regarding your former manner of life. Now this is that part of you that's still connected to the old earthly thing. You were taught to lay that aside. And the word apotithomy literally means to take off layers of clothing. Layer upon layer upon layer of images and patterns and strategies and reactions and defenses layer upon layer. And he said, this old self is being corrupted by deceitful desire. What we talked earlier, if, you, if I can only get what I want, I'll be happy. That's the old way. So, and he says, so you got to lay that part aside that you got to be renewed in the spirit of your mind, which is the same thing in Romans 12 which is, I believe, the learning process, learning God's Word, putting all those pieces together. And then, once you, as you lay aside the old and you have the doctrine, the truth to understand what you're doing, you take the new man and you put it on. 
And it now becomes part of you. It now becomes who you are, what you are. It becomes your being. It's not a tool that you go pull out of the chest and use when you need it. It becomes your being. It becomes you. You become like Him because you believe like Him now in that part of your life. That's transformation. So, we are to be consistently changed and changing. Again, let me ask, are you changing inside? Are you, are you changing? Are you learning? Are you seeing yourself? Are you recognizing patterns that are not from the Lord? Are you looking at those things or are you just looking at your earthly life? So we are to be constantly changing within, becoming less like me and more like Christ. This renewal means to fill your mind and heart with the truths of God's Word as the option to human viewpoint. Here's your heart. Here's your old system, old man. Here's the new man. This is, this is based on principles of truth. See, listen to Ephesians. He says, you, you lay aside the old, be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness from the truth. Every piece of truth that you put into your heart is joined together and put together by the Holy Spirit and it produces the, a belief system, a system, an image in your mind of the person and work of Christ and the character of Christ for you to express. So here's your old system, and it's just full of worldly, earthly priorities. Images and your strategies and all that you use in your old self. Well, here comes adversity. Where did that come from? It came from the devil's world. Who allowed it in your life, believer? God. It's perfect, perfectly designed. What you're going through right now is perfectly designed for you. For where you are in your life to reveal what? First, it's to reveal this. It exposes your old system. Deuteronomy 8, 2 and 3 said, I led you into the desert to show you what was in your heart, to reveal what was in your heart. The adversity of the desert, boy, did, they, did it not boil out who they really were? Wah, wah, wah. Big babies. That's me. Look, I got nothing to throw at the exit. I'm a big baby. You're not giving me enough attention. And I'm not trying to put you down or mock you or anything. I'm mocking me. It's just like, do you not have the Lord, son? I mean, the guy that created the universe is inside of you, who loves you with all his heart, has a plan forever for you, and you're upset because... What? See, that's this stuff. The adversity boils out this stuff. This is, listen to, listen to James 1, 2 through 4. Consider it pure joy, fellow believers, when you encounter various trials. See, there's your various trials. Knowing that the testing of your faith, and that word dokimazo means the purification of your faith. In the ancient world, they would dig ore out of the ground looking for gold. And it would be all mixed with other metals and all different kinds of stuff, and they would put it in a crucible, and they would superheat it. And the gold would sink to the bottom. It would become liquid. And every other kind of metal and any impurity would come to the top. The goldsmith would scoop out all the impurities. And when he could see his face in the liquid pool of gold, without any pimples, impurities, he knew he had pure gold. That's the process they went through to make coinage out of pure gold. They purified it. And that was the dokimazo. Is that me? Am I beeping? Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for interrupting me. All right. So adversity comes and flushes out <clears throat> the lies. Like I said, here I am in a situation in, in my life, and I say, I need more. 
the situation, the adversity of my life says, I need more. I need more. The adversity comes along and, 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 and it inspires it. it re, I react. I react. I need more. When I finally pay attention and listen to what I'm saying, I'm like, wait a minute. I don't need more. That's not biblical. That's not from God. I don't need more. Why am I saying that? Because there's a belief in here that says, I need more. And, and listen, what else it says? It says, if I had more, I'd be what? That's right. Deceitful desires. If I had more, no, you wouldn't. You wouldn't be happier. So, all right. That's how these belief systems work, and that's how these principles all come together. And so the goal is to diminish this side. Now, there's a couple of theories. Let me give you the three theories that I think are pertinent. Uh, let's see. Let's do this. One first theory. Hang on. First theory says, uh, I call it the smothering approach. Smother it. You say, well, you got all this old stuff in you that you developed growing up and all the different reactions to the hurts and difficulties of your life that you've covered all that over and, and pressed down into your gut <clears throat> and it hinders your spiritual life. So what should you do about that? Because it's what creates the double-mindedness. You know, the one day you're spiritual and the next minute you're carnal and back and forth and back and forth. It's from those two belief systems. See, we have a sin nature that makes us self-centered. But what causes us to step out of the Spirit is because there's something over here we think would serve us better. Anyway, so the issue is to take the Word of God and Christian experience and just smother that thing. If you do enough Christianity and you pray enough and you read enough and you stay completely focused all the time, on nothing but God's Word, you won't think about that. You won't think about those things that hurt you or still are hurting you or whatever it is that you're dealing with. You won't think about it. So, the second one is what I call the table system. You got all this old stuff. Here's your table. And you got all this old stuff, baggage, and it says if you get enough truth, keep piling in truth, 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 that this truth will eventually push all that off the table and, clean, and cleanse your soul. And thirdly, is what I think Paul is alluding to in Ephesians 4.22 and quite a few other passages. Look, Romans, what is it, Hebrews 12.1? What are we supposed to do? Lay aside that most besetting sin and that which entangles us, and then do what? Run the race. The laying aside part. So, it's to take off and put on. And... These two are what I think most of us do. It's what I did for years, that I would be filled, I would confess my sins, I was filled with the Spirit, and I just tried to keep all that stuff suppressed. Problem is, it just kept popping up. And, and I was not, I was miserable. Because I had so many unresolved issues where I had not forgiven, forgiven others, forgiven myself. I just stuffed it, I just covered it up. Listen, that's no way to live. These ladies I'm talking with that Jackie sees, they've just, that's what they've done. That's all they know to do. They just have to live their life. You can't stop living your life. You have, still have to go to work and pay the bills, even though your heart is broken. So you just stuff it down and go. And over time, you somehow you just put it to get some distance from it. You say, I've dealt with it. It's not true. You've not dealt with it. You just avoided it. You just never took it to the Lord. You never asked the Lord, why did you let that happen? Why did you allow that in my life? Was there a purpose for that? Of course there was. 
You don't think He loves you? He must not love me if He's allowed bad things like that. Who does that? The people they love. Well, first of all, He didn't do it. But He did allow it. And He allowed it for good. He allowed it so that you could one day use His grace to overcome it and glorify Him in doing so. That's, the, that's, what he allow, that's why He allows bad things to happen. Just so that you can have the opportunity later in your life to grab a hold of His grace and His truth and His Spirit and, and be free of those things and resolve them and forgive whoever was involved, including yourself, and see all that as part of the plan of God and be grateful that God allowed your pain so that you could glorify Him with His grace. That's the plan of God. That's the plan of God. That's why every end, you look at you look at the people who chart this thing out at the end of it. What is it? Undeserved suffering. You get you go to suffering. You don't go to prosperity. You go, well, boy, I'm out. Well, okay, you're out. You got to decide. It's a decision. How far you want to go with the Lord. How much like Him you want to become and how much of the world you're willing to let, enable you to take on. How much you're willing to speak to and demonstrate His love and His servanthood to those around you. I, I, I don't want to sound like I'm bragging. I just want to, I want to be able to serve you and my family and the people around me without without me getting in the way. Just to serve. Just to serve. I want to be that person. That's, who we're, that's the goal. That's the goal. Jesus said, put yourself last. The greatest among you is the one who serves the rest. He washed their feet. Now, you go, well, man, that'd be great. I can certainly wash some feet. Get my bucket. But I don't think that was literal. The people in your life, can you wash their feet? Stinky feet too. Stinky, nasty feet. Can you wash their feet? That's what I'm talking about. That's where we're headed. Of course, the power is the Spirit. The Christian life operates from God's power, utilizing His Word to completely transform the believer's heart. That means your beliefs, your attitudes, your relating from the human way to the divine way. Listen, some of you... listen. There are some people in this room who have got the most beautiful, wonderful human personality and everything that's just incredible. And it looks just like the Christian life. But is it? Or is that just you? Big question. In Christ, God fully loves and accepts the real you the way you are. You don't need human effort or human merit. You don't have to put on an image I used to go, I learned this prayer method, you know, confession, thanksgiving, prayers for others, and prayer for myself. So I would, before I was going to go pray, I would put on my spiritual uniform and I would march into the throne room and I would salute and I'm confessing my sins and I'm thanking you and then I must pray for others first. Whew. Boy, that was a lot of work. It was just put on. <laughs> the Lord's like, get out of here. Get out of here with that. One day I got really mad at him. I was about 30 years old. I got really, really mad at him. It took me a little while to realize. what I knew something was wrong, but I couldn't figure out what was wrong. I, I, I finally realized, I think I'm mad at God for my circumstances that he had allowed in my life. And I knew you could have changed that, buddy. That wouldn't have been nothing for you. You could have just done that and it would have worked out. So I said, you know what, Lord? I'm through giving you what I think you want. I'm going to give you the real thing. So I remember I was in the bathroom, probably just looking in the mirror, which was a frightening thing. But I walked into the living room and I looked up at the ceiling and I said, I think you are a so-and-so edited version. And 
I don't appreciate the way that you've allowed my life to go. And I think if you need to, if you would come down here in this living room, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give it to you. Full blast. Everything. And I thought, Elizabeth, I'm coming home. <laughs> if you know what that means. Instead, in my soul, I heard, thank you, son, for finally being honest with me. For being real with me. I don't want all that other stuff. I want you to be the real, I want you to be real with me. He said, now come here, let's work it out. Changed my whole life. I realized God did not want an image. He did not want me projecting an image for other people to see that would be the credibility for my Christian witness. He did not want that at all. He wanted me to actually tear it, because I already had that. He wanted me to tear that whole thing down. Tear it down. Take it off. Learn about my son. Let, let the Spirit transform your heart to be like my son, and you put that on in your life, and you be that person. You be that person. That's the Christian life. So, it's important that we understand where we're faking it. You know, the old saying, fake it till you make it. My old buddy Bruce Russell, some of you remember Bruce Russell. He was in Alcoholics Anonymous, and he said, the saying there was, you know, to bring yourself, and that was, again, that's an edited version, bring your backside and your mind will catch up. But see, with Christianity, that doesn't work. You have to bring your heart and give it to the Lord. And you have to, you have to open it up and be real. He's looking for real. See, and when that happens, and you begin to be transparent with the Lord, no longer hiding things and no longer being ashamed of the way you are, and you have to grow out of you have to grow into that. Then you can be transparent with other people. And that's when that's when socializing becomes fellowship. Because your souls begin to touch other people and their the, the love that's in you begins to touch other people, and it's not just passing by, it's connection, it's healing, it's it's it's, uh, it's, it's comfort, it's encouragement, it's admonishment. It's what we need as though we become an organism, not just a group of people for Bible study. So this is the process. The immaturity trap, and we've got just a minute. The immaturity trap, we learn God's ultimate goal for Christians. We shortcut the transformation process, which you can't do and use our human effort and will to put on a manufactured appearance and image of what we think we're supposed to look like. I think the most unfortunate of us are those, especially the ascetics, who already look like you're supposed to. You don't do anything wrong. You know, I counseled this woman and her husband, and they were... He was complaining about this and this, and she's like, I didn't do anything wrong. Her whole standard for evaluating herself in the relationship, I didn't do anything wrong. I'm like, really? You didn't do anything wrong? Well, and I'm not picking on her. I'm just saying, what are you doing right? I know you're okay. You didn't do anything wrong. See, that's, that's the ascetic says, I didn't do anything wrong. I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm okay with God. I didn't sin. Well, you didn't sin in a lascivious way. But if you got a great, beautiful, wonderful, sweet, kind personality that you were just born with, that's not me. Uh, then you may, you may look very much like a Christian. But are you? I mean, I, I, I'm not saying are you saved. I'm saying are you changing? Are you transforming? Are you being challenged? Is God showing you where you're not right? Where you need to change? Are you seeing that? Are you open to seeing that? God uses the promises, principles, and rationales of His Word to construct the divine worldview into the heart of the believer. And that's what we showed on the right, that right belief system. Enabling him or her to recognize human viewpoint that needs to be replaced with the divine. So God uses the challenges of daily life in this decaying body as we encounter the adversities of the devil's world 
to expose where we're self-oriented. It's where it's about me. Me, me, me. Our attitudes so that we can... Re- Listen, here's the reason. So that we can reject them and replace them. Not smother them. Not put them out of sight, out of mind. Not go, la, 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 Jesus, 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 Jesus. So that we don't hear any of that. No, this is just my opinion. I've had it for 35 years. I've shared it with you that long. The question is, are you willing to see those things about you that are certainly still there and deal with them and let God show them to you so you can go, I'm not going to think that way anymore. I'm going to pull that root out. Boom. Throw it away. God intentionally allows us to experience all kinds of difficulties and adversities in this life to expose the old patterns Listen, it's just old habits. This whole old thing is just an old habit. You built it a long time ago and it's still there. You're still using it. Just old patterns that don't mean anything. You still got you tied to the earthly thing. Still got your heart and value system connected to the earthly situation. Only Listen, you have to intentionally cut that cord. I have to do that with my kids. With my marriage, I have to cut that cord and give those people to God for His purpose. I mean, what if we go through war? What if we have a nuclear war? I mean, that's on the news. The government's buying millions of dollars worth of iodine. You know why? It's what you take to prevent radiation sickness. Holy smokes. What if we do? What if God allows that? I mean, what about my kids then? What about Rhonda? What am I going to do with them? How am I going to protect them? I can't protect them from radiation. I'm going to get in front of radiation. They're gods. I have to cut that cord and stop making them my happiness and stop making them my source to fill up my emptiness. You have to do that if you want to be able to let God be first so that if He lets that happen to my family, as He has done with millions and billions of families through history, when He does that, if He does that, I have to be able to understand that that's part of God's plan. It's for His glory. It's going to ultimately be come out where everything's the way it should be. And I, and I hopefully that I can come to a point where I'm grateful. I'm grateful for the things that happen in this life. You know, I'm not yet grateful for my back pain. I've had it since I was 20. I'm not grateful for it. But I'm not angry about it anymore. So I'm working on it. But I keep telling myself, "Mm, if only I could play golf again. Some of you know how much I love to golf. But again, I want something I can't have, and I think if I could only do that, See, everybody went to the beach. My son, Zach, Jeremiah, and Rick, you know what they did? Yes. Played golf. golf. (laughs) So, the Lord said, I got a plan for you, son. It had nothing to do with golf. All right. I've I've hammered on y'all as far as I can go. So, let's, uh, we'll have a prayer. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get Gary to close us in prayer and then lead us into the pledge, okay? If everybody would stand. Father, we thank you for the Word of God. We thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit that doesn't hold punches, Hmm. but tells it like it is. Thank you for a communicator who can teach us in relationship to reality. Give Ron and his family a wonderful R&R. Thank you for this uh, wonderful weather. Thank you for all the things that we have that we take for granted, our family. 
Help us to be more like your son. And thank you that Jesus Christ is our role model and he's available 24-7. Thank you for our church and for the people that come. Thank you for these things, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Attention, salute, pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States, States of America and to the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all.